three days after. Because I don't know if Papi is an anchor at the bottom of the ocean, I ignore everyone's calls. I press decline on my phone as classmates hit me up. I want to fold my ears like empty candy wrappers, small and small and smaller until no words fit inside. I'm afraid if I close my eyes, I will have accepted his will never open again. It is a losing battle. I fall asleep on the couch with the remote in my hand. I am awakened by a moan that sounds like something monstrous has clawed its way into my mother's body. Her ear cradles the house phone, but my eyes follow hers to the TV. There have been no survivors found from flight 1112. Dre has been my best friend since her family rented the apartment next door. She's been my girlfriend since sometime during seventh grade. We share a fire escape, and the summer we turned 12, we found ourselves out there at the same hours of the day. Dre would be reading a fantasy novel or pruning a half-dead tomato plant, and I'd be playing chess on my phone or looking at nail tutorials. She and I became tight as freshly laundered jeans. Both of us absorbed in our own worlds, but comfortable sharing space. Dre comes from a Southern military family. She wasn't meant to be a hippie child, but she's granola to the core, a tree-hugging, squirrel-feeding, astrology-following vegan. Me? I was a fashion-loving, chess-playing negrita who quit at the top of my game. We both know what it's like to have our parents look at us like we are dressed in neon question marks. We also know exactly what it's like to look at the other and see all the answers of ourselves there. I am a girl who will notice if your nostril hair grows long or if your nails are cut too close to the quick. I'd as soon compliment you on how well you groom your edges as I would on how smoothly you steer a debate. Dre will turn any conversation into one about gardening. If you tell a dirty joke, Dre will talk about plants that pollinate themselves. If you talk about hoeing around, you see Dre blink as her mind goes down a long winding path of tilling dirt and sowing seeds. Here we are with our interest in chess and astrology and dirt and each other. Dre has been texting me since this morning. She must have seen the news. She didn't hear it from me because I turned off my phone. The thought of speaking makes me want to uncarve myself from this skin. But you can only ignore your girlfriend for so long before she knocks on the window and sticks her head in. Is it true, Yaya? I hear the tremble in her voice that threatens the wobble in my own. Dre loved Papi as if he were her own family. We make Papi laugh with her precise school Spanish and North Carolina manners. I don't know, Dre. Anything is pos. I stop myself midway. It feels like such a lie. Nothing and no one feels possible anymore. I cannot see her nodding, but I know that she is. I know that tears are streaming down her clay brown cheeks. She tucks her long legs through the window and folds herself onto the floor, rests her head against my knee and hugs my legs. I'm here, Yaya. I'm here. For hours, we sit just like that. Dre is originally from Raleigh, and although she's lived in New York for a long time, every now and then, her accent will switch up, especially when she's upset or hurting or trying to be strong. When New Yorkers are mad, our words take on an edge. We speed talk like relay racers, struggling to pass the baton to the next snide phrase. But Dre, when she's upset, her words slow down and she becomes even more polite. And I know then she is Dr. Johnson's child through and through. Dr. Johnson takes on the same precise and calm manner, her words an unrolling ribbon that you aren't sure you'll see the end of. When Dr. Johnson is upset, her hands fold in front of her stomach 
and her head cocks to the side as she lectures us on why we should have finished our homework sooner or why a certain movie or social media clip wasn't actually as funny as we thought if we put it in a larger context. Mr. Johnson, or should I say Senior Master Sergeant Johnson, is in the Air Force. I've only met him a handful of times, and he didn't talk enough for me to evaluate how quick or slow, how calm or angry the pacing of his speech was. But Dre speaks to me slowly, like I've seen her whisper to a drooping plant, believing that her own breath can unfurl a dying leaf, can sing it back to health, can unwilt the stalk. The summer before seventh grade, Dre grew tall. When extended completely, her legs stretched beyond the bars of the fire escape and hung over the edge, like Jordan-clad pigeon perches. Dre wants to study speech therapy in college, but I've always thought she should do agriculture. I've never seen anyone make as much grow in a small pot on a fire escape as I've seen Dre coax small seeds to bud and flower here. She has a railing planter where she grows okra. On our side of the fire escape, which gets better light, she's planted tomatoes. One time, she planted these little peppers that came out green and spicy. Although the landlord has sent notices that her fire escape nursery is a fire hazard, Dre just figures out another way to stack her plants or hang them on the railing or hide them in plain sight so she can blossom. Even when the pigeons pick at her seedlings or squirrels munch on fresh shoots, Dre just laughs and puts her black hands back in the soil, decides to grow us something good. Papi never saw what Dre and I were to each other. At least, he never mentioned it. Ma is more watchful. And it's not that Ma did not like that I liked Dre. It's that she understood. I wanted no big deal to be made. There is an artist my mother loved, Juan Gabriel, who was once asked in an interview if he was gay. His reply, what's understood need not be said. I remember how mommy's eyes fluttered to me like a bee on a flower, acknowledging the pollen is sweet. I have never had to tell mommy I like girls. She knew and she knew that Dre was special. Last year, for Valentine's Day, before I left for school, mommy handed me an envelope with a $20 bill inside, stirring a pot of something fragrant while she said, pa que le compre algo nice a Andreita. With her, I did not have to pretend my best friend was just a friend. The girl next door being the girl for you is the kind of trope my English teacher would have us write essays about in class. But that's how it happened for Dre and me. One day we were best friends, and the next day we were best friends who stared at each other's mouths when we shared lip gloss. I don't think I understood the word wonder until the day our tongues touched and we both wanted to have them touch again. This girl felt about me how I felt about her. The day we first kissed, I walked into my parents' bedroom and offered thanks to the little porcelain saint Papi kept on his armoire. Thank you. Thank you. I whispered to everything that listened. The only thing about Dre that gets on my nerves is that Dre is sometimes too good. She has a scale for doing what's right that always balances out nice and evenly for her, which is why she was so disappointed that I didn't come out in the way she wanted me to. She said we shouldn't hide what we are to each other. And I told her I wasn't hiding. I just wasn't making a loudspeaker announcement to my parents or anyone. People who know me know. Dre's quirks come out in other ways too. Sometimes Dre wants me to have a clear opinion on plastic straws or water rights or my feelings about Papi. And she doesn't always see, I need time to watch the board, to come to terms 
with the possibilities. I'm telling you about my skin and my home and mostly about Dre because it's easier than telling you Bobby is dead. If I say those words, if I snap apart the air with them, whatever is binding me together will split too. The house phone has been ringing off the hook all day. Reporters from American and Latin American channels and newspapers and magazines and podcasts and websites, family members from the Bronx and DR, the Neighborhood Association, which invites us to grief counseling, special sessions that will be held at the church. The phone rings and rings and mommy's voice, raw as unprocessed sugar, responds and responds, but does not answer where we'll go from here. Here is a thing that no one knows and probably wouldn't believe if I told them. The night before Poppy got on the plane, I almost asked him not to go. It would have been the first full sentence I've spoken to him in almost a year. We haven't been close, not like we were since I stopped playing chess, since he tried to force me to go back, since I saw the certificate in the sealed envelope. When I quit playing chess, he told me I broke his heart. I never told him he'd broken mine. In the Dominican Republic, before he met mommy and came here and started this life for us, Papi was an accountant, a man of numbers and money. But here, he hustled his way into owning a billiards on Dykeman Street. I don't believe in magic or premonitions, not like Papi, who crossed himself every time he left the house. Not like Mommy, who tries to interpret dreams. But on the night before Papi left for DR, something yanked on my heart. And I wanted to ask him to stay, but I never said the words. And Papi did something he hadn't done in over a year. Came to my room to say goodnight entangled his hand in my hair while I was two strand twisting my curls. I hate when he messes up my fresh wash. But I also missed him. My fingers caught in his, held, before I moved away, removed myself from his reach. Me tengo que ir, los negocios, ya tú sabes. He's always back right before my birthday in September. But every year around this time, mommy's spine becomes rigid, her lips pulled tight as sneaker laces biting into the tongue. As his departure nears, it seems like I can see the space between my parents stretch and grow. And she refuses to drive him to the airport, despite how much I beg her so that I can be there when he leaves. Poppy stopped trying to joke her out of her ill humor years ago. And I wonder if she now regrets that his last few days here at home, alive, were spent in bed with her anger. I did not reply to him. Whenever he left, he said it was for business. I now knew he was lying. He fiddled with the light switch in my room. Negra Bella, te quiero. I know things haven't been normal between us, but I hope when I come back, we can talk about it. I peeked at him from the mirror while my fingers twirled and twirled my hair. I remember how I started to say something, then yanked the words before they could get loose. He shook his head as if changing his mind. While I'm gone, cuídate, negra and I never said a word. Once, when I was still young to chess competitions, I was in a tournament with all older kids. I'd made it to one of the last rounds and had been playing well the whole time. I was convinced I was going to win the whole thing, but I missed an opponent's trap and was put in check. 
My hands shook. Tears welled up in my eyes. The clock kept ticking, but I wouldn't move. When I finally looked up, I could see Poppy watching through the glass of the double doors. He didn't blink. He didn't shake his head. He didn't do anything, but somehow I knew. I straightened my back. I wiped my eyes. I knocked down my king. The train ride home was silent. But before we got off at our stop, Bobby turned to my nine-year-old self and said, never, ever let them see you sweat, negra. Fight until you can't breathe. And if you have to forfeit, you forfeit smiling. Make them think you let them win.